Good morning, friends. It is great to be with you on this beautiful day. Thank God for the gift of this day, for the Holy Word that has been given to us. You know, we are blessed because Paul wrote letters to the churches. That they, they were that first round of churches, if you want to say it, the, the first plants of churches, of those who followed Christ and, and those who found their life in Christ. And I'm thankful for Paul's letters uh, on two accounts. One, obviously, the letters themselves, but also we can hear the questions that are present in, in the church of that day. And so here we are 2,000 years later, and we still turn back to these teachings because they're the same words that God spoke through Paul that speaks to the church in that day, and we're still dealing with the same things, the same challenges. And that they may have a little different context or picture or appearance in the way that they show up in our lives, but the core things are always the same. And, you know, so I'm thankful that we have the word to... To rely upon. So we're in the 10th chapter. If you have your Bible, I invite you to turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 10, and, and we're going to dig right into this. It begins with, for I do not want you to be ignorant of the fact, brothers and sisters, that our ancestors were all under the cloud, that they all passed through the sea. So one of the things we struggle with in this passage is, is Paul still trying to relate back to the previous section where he talks about how we ought to run, run for the prize, that, um, that there's a lot of belief that the answer is yes, or uh, is this trying to answer another question in the Corinthian letter? There's some that believe that, but uh, most think you know this relates back to what has been written uh, prior to it. So anyway, let, let's talk about it a little bit more. It says, they were all baptized into Moses in the cloud and at the sea, they all ate the same spiritual food and drank the same spiritual drink, and they drank from the spiritual rock that accompanied them, and that rock was Christ. Nevertheless, God was not pleased with most of them. Their bodies were scattered in the wilderness. Now these things occurred as examples to keep us from setting our hearts on evil things as they did. Do not be idolaters, as some of them were, as it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink and got up and indulged in revelry. We should not commit sexual immorality, as some of them did, and in one day, 23,000 of them died. We should not test Christ, as some of them did, and were killed by snakes. And do not grumble, as some of them did, and were killed by destroying the angel, or by the destroying angel. These things happened to them as examples, and were written down as warnings for us, on whom the culmination of the ages has come. So, if you think you are standing firm, be careful that you do not fall. No temptation has overtaken you except what is common to mankind, and God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you are tempted, he will also provide a way out so that you can endure it. So, we, we hear this example of the Israelites in the desert and their unfaithfulness and certainly consequences to that. God made a covenant with them, and he said, you hold to the covenant. You hold to our agreement and I will be your God and you will be my people and, and I will go before you and I will, you know, I will bring forth every victory before you and I will bless you before all nations. And there, there's so much promise in it, but then the people rebelled. They, they began to go in their own direction. And certainly we can see that throughout biblical history, not just the, the Israelites taking hold of the promised land, uh, or not yet having done that, they're still out in the wilderness where, where this is referring to it, but you, you can look at the Israelites after they're in the promised land. You can look at the, the Christians and the, the Jews and the Christians in the New Testament. You can look at Paul's writing here, right, in 1 Corinthians, and you can look at every age up to this day where this continues to be a struggle, continues to be a struggle in that we indulge in the world. This passage has a, a piece of scripture that we love to quote in the church, um, but it's not properly interpreted, and uh, it's a struggle. I, I hear people, uh, I hear people utter it when they want to encourage another, but I also hear people state it in their own lives when they they feel maybe discouraged by it, or maybe they're questioning, uh, "Is this scripture really valid? I don't feel that way. I don't." Let's get to it. So verse 11, let's pick back up in, the <coughs> in that section. Uh, these things happened to them as examples and were written down as warnings for us on whom the culmination of the ages has come. So if you think you are standing firm, be careful that you do not fall. In other words, Paul's simply saying, 
Don't deceive yourself. Don't believe that you have this ability to stand firm and be this rock solid Christian by your own strength and, and that there's nothing that can make you waver. The, and we know Satan is the, the father of lies, the master of deception. He is constantly laying tripwires in front of us, trying to get us to trip into worldly and fleshly things and into relying on our own strength and into turning away from God. And Paul just warns us, if you think you're standing firm, if you think you've got this, beware. Okay, don't, don't let yourself, be, don't deceive yourself into thinking that way. And then in verse 13, he says, no temptation has overtaken you except what is common to mankind. So Paul says, the temptations that you face are the temptations that everybody faces. These are the same challenges that have been known throughout the ages, all the way back to the time of Paul, to the time of Jesus, to the time of Moses, uh, all the way back to the dawn of man, ever since the, that first sin and where we, we choose our way. And so um, he makes this statement, no temptation has overtaken you except what is common to mankind. And God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. So this is the verse that's mis misinterpreted. You may know it is, God will never give you more than you can handle. That's where this verse comes from. You can hear in the essence of the verse, God will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. That's a radically different image than God will not allow challenges to come in your life. God will not allow pain to come in your life. God will not allow grief to come in your life. God will not, you know, he, he won't allow any of that in your life. So God will not give you more than what you can handle. Well, th there's a couple of problems there. Um, one, it's not about us. It's not about our strength and what we can bear and what we can endure. It's about how we can live faithfully with God's strength in our life. So when, uh, you know, when our strength feels completely depleted, when our strength is gone, God's strength is still perfect. And as a people learning to walk in Christ, with, you know, when we're in the calm waters, we ought to be living in a way in which we are growing in our dependence on Christ, growing in our knowledge of Christ, so that as we do hit the storms of life, we have our eyes wholly focused on Christ and we are confident in, in his faithfulness. But there's a great promise here when it comes to temptation. It says temptation, so we're talking about that which leads us into sin. This isn't about bearing grief or bearing struggle or bearing pain. Or bear... This is about that which leads us into sin. And it says, God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. So Satan is putting the tripwires and the landmines all over the place trying to trip us up, but there is a limit to what he can do. God, God's almighty protective power is always at work in our lives. And God, you know, basically as we go through temptations and as we lean into God and we trust in God and we find God's grace and God's mercy and God's strength to be the key to our lives, I mean, we are growing in, in that relationship. But God also recognizes or, or knows that there is a a level of temptation beyond what we can bear, beyond what we can manage. And God knows it. And God, it says right in the scripture, God will not permit that. God will not allow us to be tempted beyond what we can bear. As to whether God limits Satan's power or God uh, rescues us or God protects us or prevents or uh, different circumstances, different responses by God, but God will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. So friends, I just, I want to encourage you, don't misinterpret that verse into the God will never give you more than you can handle because that's a radically different interpretation and it's not faithful to the scriptures. As we can see by reading chapter 10, Paul's very clear what he's talking about as he's teaching the Corinthian believers. He's very clear as he speaks that message to us 2,000 years later. It's still about the same battle. It's about temptation and sin. So he says, but when you are tempted, he will provide a way out so you can endure it. And that's kind of what we just talked about. What is that way out? It may be God strengthening us. It may be God putting up protection that, uh, that keeps us safe in the midst of whatever that temptation is. It may be God removing the temptation 
or limiting Satan's power or bringing another alongside of us to, uh, to walk with us, to hold us accountable, to encourage us, to uh, lead us out of the fire that, that Satan's trying to, to place around us. So it, it's the element that God is always at work in our lives. And friends, sometimes I think we, we look at sin and we feel like it, it gets the best of us a lot, but, but we hear this passage God will not let us be tempted beyond what we can bear. God knows us better than we know ourselves, and God has promised to faithfully lead us. Paul's greatest affirmation, God is faithful. God is faithful. And so let us be a people who believe, who embrace, who trust in God's faithfulness every day. Friends, let us pray. Gracious and mighty God, we thank you, we praise you, we exalt you. Lord, you are always at work in our lives and for, for the great gift of grace, of mercy, of your incredible, never ending, never wavering, never changing love. And Lord, as we walk through this world and we experience the temptation of the world, the temptation of the flesh, uh, the temptation of Satan and his, his crafty schemes, Lord, we lean into you as our strength, as our help, and as our hope knowing that indeed you will never let us be tempted beyond what we can bear. And you are constantly inviting us to lean into you, that we may overcome those temptations, that we may resist sin, and that we may walk in faithfulness. We praise you, Lord. We praise your holy name. Amen. All right, friends, it's been great to be with you this day. Uh, for me, this is Friday, so uh, we're getting ready to head into a weekend of worship and look forward to seeing you on Sunday as we uh, celebrate and praise our Lord together and we hear from the Word again. And I will look forward to being back with you as we continue our journey in chapter 10. So know that God loves you. So do I. Have a blessed day.